Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, let's jump right into this session today. Welcome to another community conversation hosted by your Autodesk community. My name is Chris, and I'll be your community host today. It's my pleasure to welcome Phil, and we will be talking about all things related to Fusion 360 today. So just a little bit about our series here, if, for those of you who might be joining for the first time. Community conversations are virtual meetups featuring expert speakers from across the Autodesk community. Sessions range from deep dives, tips and tricks, live demonstrations on products such as AutoCAD, Revit, and Fusion, obviously, to roundtables on industry insights, emerging trends, career stories, and so much more. We invite all experience levels from beginner to expert. So quickly at the beginning of each session, we always put up this safe harbor statement. This is just to let you know that there may be forward leaning statements that are made during this session. And we do not want you to use those to make any purchasing decisions because they cannot be taken as a guarantee of anything that's going into the product. So please look at the product in the way that it is today only when you're making your purchasing decisions. Um, if we do have everyone muted so that we can keep the background noise down, but we do want this to be a conversation. So if you have a question or a comment, put it in the chat or use the raise hand function and then we will uh, call on you to unmute yourself. And we'd really like to hear from you, comments, questions, whatever you have. And if you do have additional questions that you think of after the session has ended, we invite you to put those into the comment section for today's session. I'm gonna put the link for that in the chat right now so that you can jump onto that site and add your comments later on. All right, that is in the chat right now. We are also gonna be recording this session and a link to the recording will be made available shortly after the session is completed. So that is enough of me talking. Uh, we're gonna do some really quick introductions of the three of us, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Phil to take the rest of the session. So like I said, my name is Chris, and I'm the community manager for product design and manufacturing here at Autodesk. I've been here for two years now, and I come from being a customer of Autodesk for many, many years, Inventor, Vault, AutoCAD Electrical. Uh, I've spoken at Autodesk University many, many times. I was an expert elite for eight years, and now I am doing this. So. Sean, do you want to say a quick word just about who you are? Absolutely. I'm Sean Hurley, Autodesk Community Engagement Manager. I've been here quite some time. Um, like Chris, I, I came from a customer background as a mechanical designer. Um, I am in Bend, Oregon. And uh, yeah, um, I'm, this is an Ask Me Anything session. If we don't have many people asking session, you know, questions, then we can, we can roll it up too. So right. um, yeah. To you, Let's Phil. hand it over to Phil now and let you take, care, take, take control of things, Phil. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Phil Eichmiller, um, a longtime uh, Autodesk customer. Uh, I've, I've sold Autodesk and now I work at Autodesk. I just had my 10 year anniversary. Um, I've uh, got a lot of experience with Inventor and uh, all the product design suite, AutoCAD, all the all of those tools um, I used in industry to make uh, consumer electronics. And now I work on Fusion, and I have the whole time I've been here um, testing the product. I'm a quality assurance engineer, and I test the product uh, basically like a customer would um, <clears throat> to provide that that insight to development. So I I. I work also directly with customers and bring that feedback back to development um, in order to uh, uh, you know, help them focus on the things that are important for customers. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's one thing to make the commands work, but to make them work really well, that's the whole point. Right. Um, anyway, so uh, you know, welcome. I'm glad to uh, answer any questions. Uh, my expertise is uh, in Fusion, of course, is in everything modeling. Uh, anything in drawings as well, um, where I will freely admit I am uh, fairly weak is in electronics um, and uh, where I can I can tell you what's going on and probably get you through a workflow would be um, cam or simulation. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confident in those, but I can't tell you that I've mastered those those subject matters, but everything uh, drawings and design related just let her go because um, I will surely pick it up and tell you what you want to know or do my best anyway um 
if uh, so, I, I see we have Josh on the line. If, Josh, if, if you have any questions, now would be a really good time to unmute and let us know. Or if you're just looking, I can go into some uh, some of the recent uh, uh, updates. I think we can take that as a no questions. <laughs> Um, yeah, why not, Josh? Go ahead and turn on your camera. I mean, this is a, this is a conversation. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't turn you away if we were at a, <laughs> a local cafe. Welcome, Josh. Hi there. Can you guys uh, hear me? Yeah, we can hear you good. All right, perfect. Um, yeah. So um, right now, I'm actually at work. Uh, I work at a company called uh, Two Seven One. And uh, really, uh, I've been trying to, to improve my, my modeling more in, in Fusion uh, 360. That's where actually what I started learning on in, in college, in Fusion 360. And then I advanced into other um, CAD uh, software like SolidWorks and such. But um, I find myself coming back to Fusion 360, working here now. So uh, kind of get got to get my bearings going again on, on this one. Um, so I actually, I do have a few. Uh, modeling questions um, with some new products we have coming out. Um, okay. I find that they're, they're uh, a little, um, how should I say, I, more advanced modeling. I, I, I should say it that way. It's um, one thing we, we, we really want to start getting rolling is a uh, kind of like a shroud for a car. And it's going to be like contouring a lot of uh, shapes and stuff. So it's going to be um, something of an intake that covers just a big section of, of a car. And um, they want me to get going on that. And I, I thought that that was, it, it was such a complex kind of thing. And that's why I wanted to, to join and see if you guys could kind of guide me the right way. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So uh, that's a that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty good question. There's a lot uh, a lot to unpack there. Um, so um, question: um, a lot of times you might it, it, for something that's sort of that kind of shape, you might lean towards T splines or the form environment, the form workspace. Do you have any um, real experience with the form workspace? Have you have you tried that out? Actually, I don't have any experience with the form workspace or the T splines. Thing. So, uh, okay. if you could uh, guide me through that, that'd be that'd be awesome. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll show you how to get into it, and then um, what will uh, I I don't have any resources um, on tap right the second. I know there's a few. Um, you know, like I'm thinking of stuff like tutorials or classes that, that I might direct you to. Um, there was uh, uh, there there has in the past been some really good ones for automotive design and stuff using form. So I I'm sure we can find something like that. Um, but um, I think to get started, you need to be able to get into the workspace and understand a little bit of like, you know, how is it different? Why is it a special workspace in Fusion? And how does it work with um, kind of like the workflow you might imagine with it? And um, it also, I will offer an alternative, which is lofting, um, because it's basically uh, the lofting workflow that's not in T-Splines. It's just regular modeling lofting is another way to get two shapes like that that a lot of people um, will take advantage of. So um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen. Um, how's that look? Can everyone see a fusion and a mechanical part? OK. How do the menus look? Um, do they do they look teeny tiny? Or should Because uh, I could make fusion smaller and just share only fusion. And I think it might improve the, the look unless uh, unless everyone's fine with it. I can actually uh, see them see them fine if, if everyone is okay with it too. Okay. All right. We'll just go with the full sized fusion. Um, all right. So when uh, when you're working um, in <clears throat> in form, right? So I'm just starting with a blank uh, sheet right here, and where it starts is right here under create form. Now this is probably already on your toolbar unless you've customized your toolbar. My toolbar is. Uh, somewhat customized and I've taken this command off of there but you could also just pin it right back to there if you need to um, when you when you click create form what you do is you end up leaving the 
solid modeling space, um, which is also the surface modeling space. It uses the same modeling kernel. Um, and what you do is you enter into this thing called form, which is a modal workspace. So let me close this. So we're looking just at this information. Um, you know, so a modal workspace means it's like a mode. You go into this mode and you can't do anything else until you get to you're done and you get out of this mode. But you can go back and forth um, in, into this, this uh, event on your timeline, which is this form and edit it as well. So it, it does put the form into the timeline at a specific place in time. So that's the first thing to understand. Um, but this is not a parametric workspace. So this is kind of a way of like injecting non-parametric information into a parametric timeline. That's one way of looking at it. So wherever you might see one of these forms show up in your design, um, it would be like, okay, at this moment in time, this is when this thing was created. And if you want to go back and change it, you have to go into that form node to edit it. So those are some of like the, the basics of how it works in a parametric design. But um, in terms of uh, the tools, right? So this is based on what's called T-spline technology. So um, if you've ever used a spline in sketching, and I'm going to go ahead and just uh, draw a spline here, um, what you'll see is that that you know splines are these sort of rubber band-like things, right? They stretch around, um, and they they're you know they're great for defining organic shapes and things like that. And um, what you'll find is that these splines have all kinds of interesting controls, like, like how, how short is that curve? This is called the tangent handle, right? Um, how, how quickly do you want that thing to react to that curve? Do you want it to be a big gradual curve or do you want it to be a really short or you know, tight arc, right? So there's a lot of control for these sorts of things. This is, I'm, I'm setting the table here for how do T-splines work? So if you're familiar with the way regular splines work, and this would be the splines you find in AutoCAD or Inventor or, uh, or Fusion for that matter, um, and probably very similar. I don't have any experience with SolidWorks sketch splines, but I got to imagine it's pretty much the same kind of rules, right? So there's this tension that is between all of the nodes, right? Each node in the spline um, creates a place where you know the other ones will react. So notice when I move this one around, um, it it affects the information on the other side of this. Um, let me add a point here because this is this makes uh, this makes a good demonstration. Let's see, insert point uh, right there. Do it. Is it doing it? There we are. Okay. I must have pushed the wrong button, but. Um, uh, so let's see. So what I want you to notice is, is when I move this thing, nothing happens on the other side of this one, right? So when you're playing with splines, all of the change you're introducing goes through the next point and has influence on that curve, but doesn't by default has very little, you can see it moving just a tiny bit, but it's very little influence on, you know, anything beyond one, uh, you know, the, that first set of points away. That's an important thing to, to understand. So let me, uh, let me just uh, finish this sketch. Actually, I should just undo. I don't really need that sketch. All right, so now that you know how splines work, well, what are T-splines? So right there, you see that, hang on, that's a lot of changes here. There, oh, ah, oh, there we go. Um, so how do T-splines work, right? T-splines are like those sketch splines, but they're, it's in three dimensions and it follows basically the same kind of rules. So, um, I will, uh, I'll put a plane out here and um, just draw, you know, a little expanse of T-splines. So if, if you recall that in that sketch spline, there was nodes, right? Well, in T-splines, what represents those nodes are these edges. So right now I'm using the manipulator to add some edges here. So there's one, two, three, four, five edges. Um, there's only uh, one edge here in the middle. That's okay. I'm not going to demonstrate in, in that direction. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> now just to sort of say, okay, how is this similar to sketch splines? Um, uh, I'll just highlight that curve. I'll start the number one tool in here, which is the edit form tool. This is why it lives on the toolbar by default. Um, and watch what happens when I go to pull on this, the influence of what I'm doing, it, you know, it passes through the next spline, but then, or the next edge, excuse me, and completely stops right here. So it's it's even a little bit more tightly controlled. Oops, uh, double click, there we go. 
it's a little more tightly controlled than the the way you saw that sketch spline react right literally nothing is happening over here um, past that point now there's all kinds of ways to work with this and, and do that but this is just this is just showing you the basics of how this the, the material passes through these edges and what are the rules on either side of those edges that's pretty critical to understanding um, but what you wind up with um, in this this kind of workflow is a very fast creation of uh, organic elements. Um, now, it's I, I will say that that T splines requires some practice. Um, you will find yourself uh, it as you're new to it. I'm just going to be real honest. You'll find yourself frustrated, and you're going to be using that undo button, and you're going to be spending some time practicing. I also teach at Portland Community College, and when I teach T-splines, I start the students off with very basic projects that they understand. They make a skateboard. A skateboard deck is just a piece of this material that's that's warped a little bit, right? So um, that's uh, that's the demonstration I'm going to give you right now. Um, it's it's and this would be something that would be pretty hard to create. I'm going to change my uh, change my units. This would be hard to create. Oh, I am in inches. That's weird. I thought it was in millimeters. Never mind. Um, this would be hard to create with normal lofting. It would require at least seven or eight sketches to get this done with uh, normal modeling commands. So let's see. I'm going to set this to uh, 32 inches long by uh, 7.5 inches wide. And uh, oh, darn it. Um, I meant to add more, more faces. So you can see, like, you know, even. Even for me, if I don't practice this all the time, um, it's I lose the muscle memory of uh, where to put this stuff. And it's just because it's it's completely different than regular modeling. So uh, 32 by 7.5, um, and I'm gonna click. And when I click, that allows me to start playing with this stuff. So I'm gonna put in five lengths. Oh, uh, we want five of those, I think. Maybe four in that direction and um, five in this direction. I think that'll do it. Um, <clears throat> and we can add things like symmetry, right? So uh, we want both length and width symmetry here. So this is the starting shape for my skateboard. And I want you to show you some of the some of the things we've added. So this green uh, means symmetry. And you can, if you pull up on it, you'll see that you get the symmetry on both ends. Um, and if uh, just moving this side, for instance, um, now you get symmetry on both sides. So now you know you can you can work in just one quadrant of this and really you know start to get your model put together. So one of the things this this requires is also is this concept called insert edge. Now, if you remember, I just inserted a point on a sketch spline to give me more control in a specific area and let that that round that curve in a different place. Um, we need that for this, so I'm going to go ahead and just double click this. Um, that doesn't, that didn't do it. Let's just double click that to begin with. Um, a lot of times I'll do what I call noun and verb, which is pick the thing first while I'm in T-splines and then pick the tool. It's, it's actually helpful to do it that way. I'm going to move this over to this side, uh, minus 0.5. So it's halfway between the edge I've selected and the end. Um, now, what that's going to let me do is uh, make the kick flip, right? So I can now edit this, um, put a little kick flip in there. Um, so you got one on both sides. Um, that's uh, That looks like plenty. Um, if you want to add a little um, uh, rotation to it, well, this isn't going to react to that um, based on where I've got it grabbed by. But um, this manipulator... Um, is something we could kind of look at here. The the T-spline manipulator has um, all kinds of uh, handles. There's rotation handles, uh, dragging along a, a vector, like a, an axis. Um, and then these things that I call handlebars are for scaling along the planes. So each each set is matched up with the planar uh, manipulator, which is the sort of square in the middle. Um, there's plenty of stuff in the tutorials and online um, in, in Fusion Help that explains how all of these manipulator elements work. And this is part of that practice I was talking about, where if you don't, uh, if you don't learn how to master this thing and understand what, what does each little part of this manipulator do and how's it gonna affect your model, um, 
then you're you're gonna you're gonna spend more time trying to figure out what's going on in in t splines. So this this manipulator is the key to your success, and learning to use it is like learning to use a potter's wheel. Um, so. I'm sure everybody has a, a mental image of sitting down at a potter's wheel and you put a blob of clay on there and you've seen the movie, man, it's gotta be easy. Once it starts spinning, it does all the work for you. You just kind of shape it until the thing goes blah, 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 and then falls over and you can't rescue that, that lovely looking thing you just made. T-splines is a little bit like that. Um, you, that's what, at least you have undo in fusion and on a real life potter's wheel, you don't have undo. You just gotta make it into a ball again and start over. So, um, that's kind of uh, that's some of the lessons around this editing workflow with edit form and this manipulator. So that's something that's too much to go into right now, but um, just say that just just know that each little doodad on here does something completely different, and hopefully um, uh, it's it's easy to pick up. All right, so there's their kick flips. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add a little concavity to this. So I'm going to pull up on this outer edge, which of course because of symmetry will allow uh, both uh, sides to go up. So I'll just drag that up a little bit. And uh, so now we have a concave board with a kickflip, but it doesn't look exactly like a skateboard. We have to do a couple of things to it. So one of them is to flatten this curve out. And um, this don't, don't bother trying to uh, remember this. This is just an example of those kind of tricks, right? That if once you know how this manipulator works, then this stuff becomes sort of second nature. Um, oddly enough, if I scale this, it'll flatten it. So that one's flat. Oh, come on. Uh, what does it need to scale to? That's high. So it should go down to zero. There we go. If I type, if I type in zero, it helps. I don't know why it was trying to fly past that or fail or something, but anyway, zero means it's perfectly straight. Um, and which is, um, uh, also, actually, I think I used the wrong edge there. It's been a while since I designed a skateboard. I think this is the edge we want to be flat. So drag this down, type in zero. Um, yeah, there we are. And then it transitions into this, um, this concave space. Um, let's see, I think if, I think the key is this again, I'm not a skateboard designer, so, um, Feel free to make fun of me. Um, I think this edge goes down a little bit, gives it a little bit of that place for the trucks to sit under here. All right, um, pretty simple, right? Uh, when you finish your form, what you wind up with is Fusion will convert it into, um, so let me back up and show you that again. Finishing the form means exiting this modal workspace and going into back into solid modeling slash surface modeling. In order to do that, the T-spline has to be converted. And when it gets converted, it ends up being a, a body. Now, if, if Fusion can't convert it from T-splines to what's called a B-rep, a boundary representation model, you'll get a warning for that. So that, <clears throat> that could end up in some more of that, like I'm using undo to get what I want. Um, now, in order to make this a full, fledged skateboard, we have to just add the skateboard shape. So I'm going to put in a slot, um, uh, center to center should work. So I'll make that seven inches. And I think I need to put a dimension on it. So I'm going to start the dimension command. And make this 24. And I think this needs to be um, centered on this origin. So I'm going to use a, a constraint for that. So I'll just use midpoint, midpoint of that to that. And everything's centered up. We have a fully constrained sketch. Let's make sure. Ah, it's fully constrained, of course. Um, now we can now we can do this. Go over here and let's uh, Let's see if it'll let us trim this without making any extra shapes. Uh, there are no surfaces to trim. Yes, there are. There we go. Pick the stuff you want to remove. And now we have our skateboard shape. And one step later, it's thickened. 
into a piece of plywood. Um, then you go ahead and add a fillet. Skateboards get full round fillet. And if I make this out of wood, um, I, I never go this far without uh, at least making it out of the proper material. Um, we'll just say uh, oak is good enough. Oak looks a little tiny bit like plywood, so we'll use oak. And there's your skateboard. So <clears throat> to wrap things up, in order to get into using form modeling to make solid shapes like this, it's really just a matter of learning how this form workspace works, practicing with it, learning the rules of how to do it, learning how to make simple shapes like this skateboard. Uh, my students, I also introduce them uh, to making a coffee cup. Um, I can, I have, a, I have videos for that. So I could, I could actually dig up some links for that stuff. I need to probably do that. Um, so um, Sean and Chris remind me to, to grab those links for some of my tutorials. They're just short uh, uh, screencast videos that show how to make a coffee cup and also how to make the skate deck. So great place to start um, learning T-splines. And um, the last thing I'll do is just show you um, the, the parametric element of this. Um, if I go back in time, this doesn't remember any of the numbers I've entered into it. It is a direct modeling object. But if I make changes to it, notice that in the timeline, I'm down here at the bottom waving around in the timeline, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of parametric things that happen after this. So right now I've gone back in time. I'm going to make like the super, let's make a big difference here. Let's make our super radical kickflip. This is like all the kids want a taller kickflip this year or something. Uh, let's see, hopefully this works if I didn't break anything. Um, ah, <laughs> well, that's okay. Um, the, the trim just, uh, just suddenly it, it lost track of what it was doing. Um, but that's okay. That's it's parametric. Whoa. Uh, it doesn't like the fillet. Okay. I don't know why the fillet's not happy. Yeah. So, all right. Well, um, it's a nice deck. Yeah, it's it. It must have just. I think it just lost track of which just edges. Lost track of which edges you had selected. Yeah, let's get that on there. Point one eight seven five. There we are. Yeah, and we're this back. is a this is a tutorial I'd love to see because I've never played with T splines either, and I think this would be a good place to start. Cool. I think it's a, it's a great example. I mean, it's a it's something simple that you can do it instead of starting out on like a like a, a fender of a car, which has far more things, you know. Right, right, start small. Yeah, this is this is the kind of activity where it's it's something that you know what it is, right? If you already intrinsically know what it is um, and you've seen it, you've touched one, you've ridden on one of these things, um, right. then, the, then your mind isn't confused with, well, what shape should it be? You already know what shape it should be. And then, so when you start to force it to be that shape, it just feels natural. So it puts the learning in front in, instead of the confusion, you know. I hate to actually say this, but I think the last time I was on a skateboard was probably 1978. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it didn't go well. Uh, no, uh, yeah, I've, I've tried to teach my kids to skateboard until I, uh, the second time I broke my elbow. Um, and so, you know, now I just ride a bicycle and hope I don't fall off. But anyway, so so Josh, uh, does that look like the the kind of stuff that you might need to make what you're what you're going to be making? Yeah, actually, uh, I think this really really helped a lot just because of the way I was actually thinking of uh, just starting to, to model it when you were going through this process was like, oh, okay, well, here's where I can place this detail and pull it up and and, and start contouring what I need to to be present in this model. And then uh, my question arose, which is like, okay, now, well, now I, basically I have a face, right, with the with the details I need. How would I make it into like a solid? And then that's when you pulled out the, the thicken command, and, and there it is, it's a solid. Okay, so I think I got everything I need now. Um, I, I think it's just the practice so that's probably gonna take me a while. Yeah, cool. So uh, just a couple other small small details, right? So if I go in here, just this will just take a second. If I make a closed shape, like this is this is just a box. This is the box command. It's just a what we call pillows, right? Um, if as long as none of these 
faces have been edited so they kind of crash into each other and it, it that's what's going to prevent it from turning it into a solid when i hit finish form this just becomes a closed solid so there's there's no thicken required here this thing is is as solid as it gets um just poke a hole in it and there's a, there's a threaded hole in it right there right so um so you know if you're if you're trying to make a sheet then you're going to be thickening in it thickening it and that would be something like sheet metal or a piece of plastic maybe that has a, a pretty much a, a continual consistent thickness um, but if you're making solids you can do that like i do a uh, bike grips that's another project we do we bring in a handlebars and we model a bike grip around it um, you could probably make that same shape with the revolve command but but fusion makes that rubbery bike grip um, with t-splines very very quickly even compared to like just you know, making a revolve command out of it. Um, and one last thing, I, I did want to show this when I was um, in here. So this is uh, this is that hood scoop shape, right? So if I do this, um, I'll just I'll start here, um, but I'm going to remove symmetry. Yeah, let's get rid of the symmetry. Um, now let's let's make the hood scoop. Um, I'm going to um, let's see if I can remember unweld edges right there. Uh, that does something kind of funny, but there's your hood scoop, wow. right? So I just disconnected where those edges were were welded together in the middle, and then it allows you to pull it apart. Um, and you know, next thing you know, you've you've got a cool uh, aftermarket automotive hood scoop or something like that. So, okay. all right. Um, Anyway, thanks, thanks, Josh. That was a that was a fun thing. So uh, I'll just have to dig up some of those tutorials about T splines for you and uh, see see if we can get you going in the right direction. Hopefully, you have a, a couple of hours to watch stuff and practice. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. it's, it, it'll pay off. <laughs> Phil, if you yeah, get those and... links, we can add those to the comments on the uh, community conversations page, and then Josh can grab them at his leisure. Or do you want to put them in the chat yet today? um well let's let's see what other questions there are and um okay. let, me, let me see if i can quickly find those links there's uh it shouldn't be that difficult um wait a second okay. am i logged in i am logged in as my uh as my teacher role um let me let me just find the screencast recorder and that should take me to my screencasts so i'll get there so i uh you know any other questions from anyone anyone else online um while this is while i'm doing some paperwork over here did that pretty much cover what you were looking for josh yes that did uh help me a lot actually I, like i said i think it's just going to be now just the practicing and and actually getting into to to modeling what what we're looking for and hopefully um with some practice I, i'll be able to get that done well awesome don't forget about the, the forums if you run into individual questions along the way you know you can always jump that put those in the forums and we can find somebody to walk you through it um okay screencast is is disappointing me here i just tried to log in and it, it it just went right back to a blank login state so i'm not sure what's going on um my computer might be sufficiently confused because i'm logged into the autodesk network i'm also uh, logged into this meeting and i'm also logged into fusion and so in there there's something as confused about who i am <laughs> um when i'm using more than one uh, autodesk id at, at one time here so i'll have to uh, grab this after we're done with the meeting but There'll be three three uh, steps. It's for coffee cup. There's uh, just make the T-spline shape. Then it's uh, make the solids out of that T-spline shape. So it's like a solid coffee cup. And then step three is um, add materials and, and decals and make a nice picture out of it. So uh, rendering, I should say, but yeah, an image. Right. Um, all right. So um, the you know without any other questions, one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, my favorite improvement. So we have Fusion has releases, uh, you know, around every eight weeks or so. It's a major release. So it's several times a year, uh, depending on the scheduling and stuff like that. Um, 
we'll put out what's called a major release. Um, in between those, we put out minor releases, which are mostly just uh, updates for bug fixes and, and minor things that don't uh, add new features. There's, there's, you're not going to find a lot of new features. And one of those is going to be happening very soon, actually. Um, the, so, so focusing back on the last complete update, everyone should have this build by now. It's the, the commercial production. They solved an issue, um, which is this. If, if you've done any amount of drafting and you've come to Fusion, this is a brand new command now, auxiliary view. This is pretty standard for uh, drawing view management of, of uh, 3D objects in, in a uh, program like Inventor. Um, auxiliary views are a standard drafting uh, mode. Um, it's, it's because you, in order to do something like locate the screw holes that you see on the screen right now, or the drilled holes, um, you have to look at it from what's called an orthographic view, where you're looking at it, what's uh, another term for it is normal to the view. And so um, here is, uh, here's the, I'll show just this little workflow here. So here's the part that's in that drawing. And I've updated the part to add this little tapped hole right here um, for whatever purpose. You know, you could imagine that maybe uh, somebody needs to screw down some uh, uh, electrical grounding lug or something right there. Who knows what you need a little tapped hole like that for. But it's on this, this face that doesn't face straight up or straight to the side. In, in any uh, in any way, right? So the, the faces that follow the view cube are called orthographic faces, and this is not following any of the view cube faces. It's sort of non-orthographic. So I'm going to save this and uh, lock those changes in. And now I'm sending this over to the my drafter. So I happen to be my own drafter, but let's say you work in a big engineering department, and you might say, hey, drafters, the part is up to date. Make sure your drawing is up to date. And uh, that's this is me typing a, a note in Slack to the drafters. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, now that this is this part's up to date, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, accept those changes. It's going to update, and this should bring in um, this little minor change here. Now these these two dimensions got a little confused about what to do. Um, not surprising, we just sort of changed their world, um, and they they reacted as best they could move this over here and so now we want to be able to describe where exactly is this hole um, using this style of dimensioning and the only way to do that is with an auxiliary view and so if you've struggled doing this before well uh, joyous day here we have it um, and i was hoping that there was a slice option but it doesn't appear that there is if it's anything like inventors you know, auxiliary view, you have to place the view first, and then you can go and cut it up with a yeah or something. Yeah, what what I want to do is show just this face using uh, what would in, in the section view it would be called a slice, where it only shows mm -hmm. you the plane where you're sectioning it. And the other thing here is like it's it's projected uh, off of the, you know perfectly orthographically projected off of that edge. If I want to break that alignment, I just press the shift key. And that's literally just a click. It's not a hold. You just click it. It's like a toggle, and it will uh, break the alignment. Um, this works for other views as well. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK here and set that thing down. Um, doesn't, doesn't look like it's the easiest thing to work with right at the moment. So let's edit this and maybe make some changes. Um, so I'm going to have to ask them uh, how on earth I could maybe limit this view to only that face. It's possible they didn't, that was not in scope for this release. They're doing drawings updates and improvements on all commands um, th uh, that they're working on anyway, on a very regular basis. I mean, every single release, there's drawings updates. There's, there's several teams working on this. So I got to imagine this is just in the backlog because really my expectation is pretty standard that I could force it to show me only this face. Right. But I will, I will uh, go ahead and turn it to uh, just visible edges only. Um, that will help. And um, now I can apply uh, the center mark and uh, give it some dimensions that uh, make sense. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Oops. This is the one I want. There we are. So now I can, I can show, um, you know, dimensions to like locate this thing. And I can also put on, uh, use the hole and thread note uh, to call out the hole. 
So anyway, um, oh, that's interesting. Let's make it look a little bit more like it oughta. There we go. Yep. So there you have it. Um, so this is a uh, this is. <laughs> It may not seem like that big of a deal, but it's a huge deal because there was a workaround for this before that was really involved. Um, it involved making a named view in the uh, workspace and then calling out that named view. Um, now you can just sort of do it automatically. Um, but uh, since I mentioned named views, here's here's where that lives. If you, if you want to have a special view that you can uh, refer to while you're modeling, um, this is a really cool uh, set of commands. And you could also create your own named views that can be pulled up in drawing. So if you do have a very specific named view, that's something that the auxiliary view command has a hard time getting at, um, you could go in here and just place it. So if I, if I click this and use look at, um, I could uh, now call this out as a new named view. And I'd say uh, alternate to aux view in drawing. Um, so now I have uh, an alternative representation of that same face that that would be vertical, right? Um, so now I can, uh, oh wait, let me save that. I need to save it for that to take place. Uh, there we go. It's, it's, everything's redrawing, especially slow today. Um, might be because I've got the video card completely occupied. All right, that should be up to date. Now I'm going to place a base view of this object and I'm going to go to the orientation and look what I have available now, the alternate to the aux view for the drawing. Um, and when I put that in there, um, there you have it. So two ways of getting uh, at to a, a view that um, is not one of your orthographic views. So name view, if you've got to have it turned just so, set that up in the part, create a name view, call it out when you're placing a, a base view of this thing, or just use the auxiliary view tool, which is uh, pretty nifty and uh, pretty standard in industry. How's that? So anyway, that was my favorite improvement. So. That's pretty cool. I know there's been a lot of, uh people posting over the last several years asking for this. Yeah, that's that's so. not surprising. And it's not at all obvious what that workaround was. <laughs> I, right. uh, I, I think I had to discover it all on my own. <laughs> I mean, it was built in, but I was just like, how would I do this? And then one day I figured it out. No one told me. Um, so if I have to figure it out, I can't imagine what other people are going through. But uh, uh, other other recent improvements, if you like Mac Trackpad, we're we're really honing the experience with the uh, the Trackpad uh, preview. It's called Native Trackpad. Um, it uses the uh, onboard Trackpad drivers for Mac OS instead of the ones that Fusion has, and it's a little smoother experience if you're using a Mac. Uh, go to Preferences and look for the preview feature called Native Trackpad. Um, Oh, Josh does have one more question. Though. Oh, good. Yeah, I have one more question. If we still have time, I don't know if we we'll be able to do it or not. So uh, I I just wanted to see um, if there was a uh, I guess uh, a good way of using the spline uh, drawings in in a three D kind of uh, environment. Just because I I recently I was doing a project where where I think it would have been best to use a spline to 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 model a, a pipe that that got kind of complex. So I basically put a, a bunch of faces in, in different um, positions, and I would use the spline command to, to get into the center of those faces, and then I would lock them all together. So it would uh, kind of give me a natural natural flow. Just that I I was having issues with like. Uh, there was bulges coming out because of the way that the spline was forming. I don't know if you could. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, okay. So um, one thing 
I can find is there's there is a uh, and and um, Sean and Chris, I may have provided this link before, so stop me if I have to go too far here. Um, the uh, the lofting forum post that Jeff Strader made. Um, that's only familiar to me. And I and I know I've I've referred to it before, and I'm looking through because I mean, it's really a definitive guide to lofting, and I I can find the link. I know for sure I can find the link to this because it's not a screencast, but I have to go look for it. But I rather than watch me um in our yeah, remaining while, minutes while you're doing while you're doing what you're doing, I'll go and look, we'll look for it. Yeah, it's a particular forum post, so I don't even know what it is. I don't think you can search that. I just happen to grab the link for it, and I bring it out every time I have to explain lofting, but. Um, we will find it because I use it in my class and I can um, I can spend a few minutes to dig around in my class materials to find it. Um, what you're after, Josh, is um, using rails, right? So did you, I, I take it you didn't have any rails for your the lofting you were doing? Yeah, just because of like how complex the, the shape got in, in that loft, I, yep. I found it kind of hard to identify rails, especially because they weren't... Um, the faces of these shapes, they weren't lined up in, in, in any form or way, in any plane. So it was like, I, I thought just going through the, the spline would have been the, the best way and, and hopefully it would define itself with the, with the faces I have. Um, yeah, I mean, so the, okay, so the loft, you're using the spline as a center rail for your loft then? Right, correct. Okay. Um, well, let's let's experiment with that and just see. This is um, I, my imagination is failing me here, so um, I'm gonna just set out a, a spline with several nodes, and that'll be our that'll be our link. And I think I found your your Jeff Strader post. Um, I think we just posted the same one, Sean. Oh, sweet. Great minds think alike. Oh, I guess it is searchable. Yeah. Google. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did it right in the forms. Oh, yeah, I did it in Google. Yeah. <laughs> that that is it. That's the textbook uh, for that's so for those of you who don't know, Jeff Strader and I do all of our AU classes together. That's Autodesk University classes. And uh, that's just one of the chapters in the book we're going to write one day. So um, I promise. If I keep saying that, it's going to happen. All right. So I'm going to put um, I'm going to put this uh, plane along path here, and I'll put another plane along path over here, um, and then I'll put um, one down on the end. Um, here, let's let's edit this one. And put it over here on the sand. We only really need three. Okay, so if this is your center line, then uh, the shapes you're lofting um, might. Um, I'm just going to try to pick something more interesting than a circle. I'll use uh, I'll use slots. Uh, is that a center slot? Which is it? The one that starts at the center. There we are. Uh, so this it's like semi regular shape, right? Um, let's use this one. And since I'm not paying much attention, I will have by default uh, different um, shape slots. So the loft command will have something to do um, to transition the shape from one profile to the next. And uh, well, here, let's throw it a curveball and it, it ends uh, in a circular shape. Okay, just what I like curveballs and live demonstrations. Let's see how <laughs> I roll here. What can go wrong? <laughs> I don't know. I want it to go wrong because then I'll learn something. Uh, let's see. There's our profile, profile, profile. Yeah, not the most compelling, you know, representation of that path, right? So let's use our uh, center line. A rail and now we have uh, this sort of thing so it's it looks pretty well behaved yeah. um the thing i was going to get at 
Josh, is what's going on at these profiles. The only other real control you have right here is how Fusion wants to treat the condition at each profile. So a profile two is not going to let us uh, pick anything because the center line is actually managing how this passes through. There's no, there's no way to say, you know, pinch in or pinch out or, you know, do something like that. But um, at either end, there is a little bit of control. You can, uh, rather than connected, which is basically, uh, it's like an ortho, like a right angle at that point, um, you can add direction. And what direction lets you do is sort of uh, decide how it's terminating when it gets there. So it can be, you know, it could kind of be coming at it that way, or um, could be a little bulgy. So maybe some of the some of the inconsistency you're seeing might be addressable using that style. Um, if I go to the other end condition, obviously you get the same kind of thing. You can um, get to the manipulator here. Um, you can tell it, you know, is it uh, the weight of that is really not very much. There you go. Gave it a little more takeoff weight. Um, and then you can control what direction it's going when it when it hits that last profile. Takeoff weight and angle are controllable right here. That's this is the takeoff, um, basically is what that means. So there's that's the only control I know of for lofts at, without using rails. I mean, you know, exterior rails rather than a center line rail. And you can't use them together. You get one or the other. Right. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I just opened actually that that link that you guys posted. I, I'm gonna take a look at this, and it, it looks like it, it should help a lot actually with this this model I'm, I've been working on. So, Great. so yeah, thank you for that. Cool. Yeah, I hope it helps. Um, that's uh, uh, lofting is complex, but I think once you understand a few of the rules, um, then it's then you can you can start to. This is unbelievable. Special guest. <laughs> Every single time. I don't know what it is about. So I, I'm going to just assume that Kaiser Permanente puts out all their calls in the 10 o'clock hour. <laughs> I, I don't even know why they would be calling me. So. I just, but nevertheless, I, every single time we do this community conversation, I forget to turn off phone my phone rings. and I get my one phone call a month. Um, and that's it. So, all right. <laughs> how, how fun is that? All right. So. Got anything else for us, Josh? No, actually, I, I think that that'll do it for me. I don't know if anyone else is on that had a question. And I just want to thank you guys so much for your help, especially on that, no on that first uh, concept too. That's that's a that's a big one. Yeah, that's one I'm going to start playing around with myself too because I'm still trying to learn fusion, and that looks like a lot of fun. All right. All right. Then. Do we want to? Do you have anything else you want to show off, Phil, or do we want to wrap up? Um, no, I, I didn't. I, it's pretty much all I, I had set aside. You know, just some of the recent updates, uh, goodness, um, drawing improvements, trackpad mm -hmm. improvements, um, and that there's a there's an update coming out uh, shortly, if not today. Um, so to, in order to take that update, just uh, restart Fusion, and you should see a little. A little one appears uh, up here on this item right here, the job status. Um, but it only uh, Fusion will only go looking for an update if you've restarted it. Um, so it's not going to interrupt you while you're working. So if you wanted to uh, just check later on, restart Fusion, see if a one appears here, and when it does, you know, look and see that uh, the progress of that update, and then it'll prompt you to restart Fusion again to accept the update. So. Uh, pretty, pretty good. I mean, just bug fixes uh, this time around, um, but there's uh, about 25% uh, of the tickets are crash fixes. So um, there's some uh, stability improvements. Uh, of course, we do that every single release, but it's, it's nice yeah. to see those go in. In, in my uh, day job, I spend, uh, if I'm not doing this kind of thing, I spend a lot of time looking at crashes. So um, 
we use automatic means to detect them. So for anyone who sees a crash report happen in Fusion, which is an unfortunate event, uh, make it better for yourself and for everyone else by clicking send on that thing. If you have time, type in what it is you were doing and a nice comment about your workflow really helps. And uh, when we when we see these things accumulate, uh, automatic systems tell us to go look for them. That'll be somebody like me. I'll go in and try to figure out what's going on and try to reproduce that crash. And then that allows us to debug it. So those reports are critical. So I uh, appreciate every time you send one in, if you do. Awesome. And if you don't, send them in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you wanna hand the screen back to me then? Oh yeah, sure, I'm sorry. No, no problem, no problem. I wanna there make sure go. you're done. I don't wanna interrupt you if you've got more to more to do here. Uh, no, I, uh, that's right. it. Any, right. Anything else would take another hour. Another hour. We'll do that in August. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, thank you, Josh, for asking some fantastic questions. And I'm glad that we could help you out at least a little bit with those. Thanks, Phil, for more great demonstrations, as you always do. It's always, I learn something every time I do one of these. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, we did record this session, and soon after we will be posting the, uh, the recording and you'll be able to, to view it. And also, when you do leave the session today, there's going to be a survey that will pop up on your screen, and it doesn't take very long at all to do. We would love to hear what you think about uh, how we're doing with these things. So please take a moment and do the survey before you, before you leave us. Just a reminder, we do have a break in July, so. Yes, that's a good point. So we will be back in August with more great community conversations. So keep an eye on the, uh, the calendar. I'm gonna post that right now while I'm thinking about it. I've got the link for the calendar so you can see what's coming up. I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. So keep an eye on that calendar, see what our upcoming events are. Also, if you have an idea for a community conversation, let us know what you think. And uh, there's a proposal link that I also posted just now that you could fill out and let us know what your idea is for a, an upcoming session that you might wanna host. Uh, we do wanna remind you of all of the fantastic resources available in the uh, community. There's just so much that uh, can help you out in so many different ways, social media, forums, uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn. We've got our student group hub, our community groups. We've got two blogs, one by us, the community journal, and one that's written by users like you, the uh, community voices blog. Check out all of these different resources and become a, a very active part of our community because we just love to hear from, our, from people. And on that note, I will say thank you one more time and see you next time. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thanks, Phil. Phil. And best of luck with that auto design, Josh. Yeah. Post your results in the forums. We'd love to see how you're doing. Absolutely. <laughs>